today is January 16, 2015. I'm interviewing Tony Thompson at his home in Norfolk. The interviewer is Mary Louise Torrent, working with Central Connecticut State University. Um, so could you please state your full name, date of birth, city, and state in which you live? Okay, my real name is Chilton Thompson. My date of birth is 20 October 1942. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I live in Norfolk, Connecticut. In which war did you serve? Vietnam. Um, and what was your branch of service? Army. And your highest rank? Specialist fifth class. And in what general locations did you serve? I was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, then in Augsburg, Germany with the 1st Infantry Division, then in Vietnam, sorry, in Augsburg, Germany with the 24th Infantry Division, and in Vietnam with the 1st Infantry Division. Okay. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And where were you living at the time? When I enlisted? Yes. I suppose technically I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, but I'd been here in Connecticut at university before. Um, and where did you live? Okay, I'm sorry. Do you recall the date when you enlisted? Yeah, because it's on my, uh, I think it was the 15th of September, 1963. And why did you join? Why did you enlist? Because I would have been drafted very shortly. I'd been kicked out of Yale and I knew I'd be drafted. Okay. Why did you choose the service branch you joined? The Army? That's a good question. I had a friend at Yale who suggested we join the Marines together, but I guess I was put off by what I'd heard about Paris Island and so forth. Okay. Um, tell me about your first days in the service. I enlisted in Cleveland, Ohio, and that evening we were put on a bus to go down to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Um, on the bus were a pretty typical cross-section of the city of Cleveland, which included a number of very large, very muscular black guys. As a white suburban kid, I hadn't known any black Americans very well, so I was a little intimidated, but I quickly found that absolutely I would never have any problems whatsoever with black Americans in the U.S. Army. Okay. Um, how did it feel when you were with those gentlemen in your first day of service? Well, obviously I was a little nervous, but uh, I'm kind of a fairly competent person and I didn't feel intimidated. I thought whatever it was would be manageable because I was going the way of so many million American men before. Uh, Fort Leonard Wood was a perfectly okay environment as far as I was concerned. And um, tell me about the boot camp training experiences. That was kind of interesting and it bears on why I wasn't too concerned about uh, the people I was with. I had gone through a typical traditional WASP upbringing. I had gone to summer camp in Maine, overnight camp, when I was nine or ten or something like that. So I'd been away from home living in a tent before with other guys I didn't particularly like anyway. And then I went to a New England boarding school, which was very like a monastic colony in those days. And sports and being outdoors were just mandatory and just part of the environment. Uh, at my school, there was a custom that we generally ran everywhere. Um, so I was fitter than I expected in comparison with these other guys. A lot of these guys from the inner city were very big and very muscular, but they weren't very fit. And, you know, they hadn't done any sports. And most of basic training was just, you know, typically doing push-ups and running around and learning the parts of the rifle and just very basic stuff. And uh, none of it was, I didn't find any of it very challenging. Uh, we went on a large, a long, several long, marches, but uh, again, um, I was lucky my boots fit and I didn't have any trouble. Interesting point. <laughs> um, do you remember your instructor? Yes. We had, my sergeant was named Sergeant Duty. Um, I actually have written about him in that, that book I gave you. Um, he was like a traditional southern, kind of a hillbilly, but uh, a very, I found a very likable man. I liked him, and he was very careful about boot fitting, for example, which is one reason I didn't have any trouble with my boots. He was a veteran infantryman. 
And uh, he knew lots of these Jodi choruses. I don't know if you know what a Jodi chorus is, but when you're marching, the sergeant will sing, I don't know, but I've been told. And the men say, da 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 sound off one, two, sound off three, four, take it on down one. And he could keep these up for hours and hours and hours. And I won't repeat any of his now because they are, without exception, <laughs> filthy and unacceptable for public consumption. But um, he was he was an interesting and amusing man. We had a black for a black a platoon leader, Lieutenant something. I looked it up, and again, I put it in my book. I've got a yearbook or uh, graduation book from basic training. And all these people are in it. He was a super fit, very thin very aloof black guy. We had very little contact with him. Our contact was with the sergeants. In fact, that was true throughout the Army. I had very little contact with officers while I was in the Army. Okay. Sergeants gave me orders and, or repeated orders from officers and I carried them out. So you felt like you got through boot camp okay? It wasn't too yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound immodest, but I think I did very well. I was quite okay. pleased with myself. I lost a fair amount of weight even though we had very rich, greasy, southern-style food, uh, but there never seemed to be quite enough of it. And uh, we would buy things like Baby Ruth candy bars from the PX, buy the box. But even so, we felt, you know, we never felt full. Uh, I guess we were doing a lot more outdoor exercise than I was normally doing. So you stayed in shape. Um, after boot camp, where did you go? I was sent to Augsburg, Germany on a troop ship via a troop ship. We went to Bremerhaven and then by rail down to Augsburg. My first night in Augsburg was actually one of my worst experiences in the Army, and uh, it turned out to be a kind of a very exceptional thing. I got there, and my unit, the unit I was going to join, was the divisional survey team. I was an artillery surveyor. I'd been at Fort Sill. And they were out in the field, so I had to go into some sort of you know, temporary uh, place in this large barracks. The barracks had been built by the Luftwaffe, um, so they were they were pretty good. They were nice wooden floors and so on. But anyway, I get in there and uh, I go to bed the first night in this long row of bunks. And at about seemed like middle of the night, but it was probably about ten thirty or eleven. Two guys come in and they immediately get into the most tremendous, tremendous raging argument. And suddenly there's a terrific punch, and you can see because there's light coming in uh, from the uh, truck park outside, which was lighted at night. And this black guy, whip it thin, very quick, has pasted this big white guy on the side of the head. Bonk! Without any hesitation, the white guy then scoops up a thing which is called a bunk adapter, which is a piece of pipe for turning two bunks into a double bunk. And blast this black guy, first on the side of the head, and then I think maybe on his shoulder. Anyway, completely flattens the black guy. He then says, well, he says various things, which I'm not going to repeat just now, and grabs the black guy's footlocker and throws it out the window. I thought he was going to throw the black guy out the window, and I thought, oh, God, this is the racial stuff I've heard about, and it's terrible, and I don't know how I'm going to do deal with this, and should I go and get somebody, what do, what do I do? Well, everybody else was just ignoring it. So I thought, okay, best thing is to do nothing. It's the coward's way out, but it's the best thing to do. Well, what I found out in the morning was what I had assumed was some sort of racial incident was no such thing. The two guys were actually friends of a sort. One was the colonel's jeep driver, and the other, the black guy, was his mechanic, his jeep mechanic. The black guy was a divisional boxer. And it turned out that he was a pretty good boxer, but Coley Myers, the big white hillbilly, was a much better fighter. And Walker had broken his hand hitting Myers in the head, because Myers's head was a lot harder than Walker's hand. On the other hand, the bunk adapter that um, Myers used put Walker completely out of action. Um, everybody was appalled by this. Our first sergeant, who was a wonderful, really tough Texan named Herbert Waters, was absolutely disgusted by it and told them both they'd go to the stockade in Mannheim if anything else like this ever happened again. Nothing else like that ever happened again. It was just a freak. It was just a one-off. We had lots of occasions where the cooks were fighting with each other drunkenly and so forth, but that was meaningless. Nobody paid any attention to that. 
Um, what was your assignment there? I was on the divisional survey team. I was an artillery surveyor, um, which was kind of fun. We used basically, I now see the same methods as the Roman army, because I was watching some surveyors here, and nowadays they use you know laser range finders and electronic gizmos and GSM and so forth. Um, we were using theatolites, chains, red and white striped sticks, that sort of thing. Our job was to figure out, first of all, where the guns were, and then where the target was, because it's very difficult to actually hit anything with artillery if you don't know where both the guns and the target are. And um, we would sit in holes in training areas and, and watch you know, the rounds landing. It was then the job of the forward observer, who was a, an officer, to sort of bring the fire in right on target. Um, we were further away from the target than he was, which I thought was a very good thing, <laughs> because we had several um, training, training ground accidents where we actually lobbed around into places where we weren't supposed to. But this was an old training ground. It had been going on for a long time. Okay. And then where did you go after that? I went to Vietnam. I, I volunteered to go to Vietnam, must have been in sometime in 1965, because I got bored with this German training ground stuff. And uh, by that time, I was working at division headquarters. And I just felt I wanted to do something different. Also, also I was um, very fed up with the German climate because we're you know, out in the cold and wet a lot of the year, and I thought being someplace hot, and I assumed sunny would be a nice change. Not exactly what you're We knew nothing about Vietnam. There was a call for volunteers, but it wasn't accompanied by what it would be today, nice brochures or anything like that. It was just, President Johnson wants you to go to Vietnam, and I thought, okay, well, not that I want to obey President Johnson, but it sounds like an interesting thing to do. Different from what you had. What, um, what was a typical day like for you? In Germany or in Vietnam? in Vietnam? We lived in tents. We would wake up very early, unless we'd been on um, guard duty or something like that, or a patrol at night. We would get up, we'd go to the mess hall, the mess tent, we'd eat, and then we'd go right to work. And I don't remember what time work started, but it started early. Uh, we worked in tents, and uh, we just worked off and on through the day. We usually worked in the evening. We worked seven days a week. There were also details like um, one thing that I don't think is stressed enough in things I've read about Vietnam or films, sandbags. We spent very, very much time doing sandbag duty, filling sandbags, thousands and thousands of sandbags, uh, which is not hard work, but it's tedious. And that can be effective. What was your work other than when you had the details? What was your job over there? My job was redeployment. Okay. I sent people home. When I got there with another guy, he was put in charge of redeploying dead people. I was extremely lucky. I got to redeploy live people. He became very depressed. My job, on the other hand, was very, very enjoyable because people were deeply grateful for getting their orders to go home, which is what I was organizing. And uh, sometimes they would even give me small presents, like a bottle of whiskey or something. And uh, I got to fly around a lot because it was difficult to keep track of all these people because our records were in a mess. Um, did you see any combat? Not really. I fired one shot in Vietnam, and it was from a pistol into the ground. I was considering buying the pistol it was a Smith & Wesson revolver, and I wanted to make sure it worked before I bought it. Um, we went on a patrol. We were shot at on a regular basis by a guy we called the Lone Sniper. But the only person he ever hit was the first sergeant, and that was before I got there. Uh, we were also machine gunned one evening by what turned out to be our um, Korean allies, but that was a mistake. On the other hand, it was very, very frightening at the time, um, mistake or not. Um, were there casualties in your unit? Yes, there were casualties. I mean, um, I was in the headquarters company, the 1st Infantry Division, and we lost people from malaria, um, injuries. I don't know if they were exactly battle casualties. We did have one sergeant who shot himself in the leg 
he claimed he was practicing quick draw. I think he was trying to get out of the war myself, but um, but we were very aware that that bad things were happening. We saw phantom strikes out in the bush near us. Uh, the division band of all people were um, ambushed on a patrol just outside our main gate, um, and they were part of our company, I think. And uh, I saw a jeep that had been machine gunned that was full of American blood and well, other things which were not very nice. And you were aware there was a war going on. Uh, it was spooky. It was spooky at night. You could hear artillery fire. And it was close. Yeah, and you could hear, um, well, you, there, sometimes machine gun fire, and also they'd be firing illumination rounds at night, um, WP. And uh, you know, everything seemed quite eerie, if you, particularly if you're on guard, you're out in the bunker by yourself. Um, I would be listening to my little Sony transistor radio, which was strictly forbidden, but I figured nobody would catch me. Yeah, no one's going to share you with um, So you weren't a prisoner of war? No way. Okay. Um, were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes, I've listed them. The only one that actually meant anything was this thing, the Army Commendation Medal. Um, which the Army has very kindly, or Department of Defense has kindly sent me three of, because about every 10 years I get a letter saying that they very sorry they'd lost my records, and here's the medal I was entitled to all those years before. I now have three of them. They're really nice medals. Okay. What, is, what were the other ones? Oh, I, whatever it was, I listed a um, Vietnam Service Medal. Uh, I've got four, four of them, something like that. Okay. Um, the Commendation Medal was nice. The men called it the Green Weenie because it comes with a little green, little green ribbon, and uh, it's like a good conduct medal for working hard or something like that. Okay, but it again acknowledges what you did. Yeah, I mean we worked very, very hard, no doubt about it. Did you sustain any, any injuries? No. Okay. Um, How did you stay in touch with your family? We had the Army Post Office system. I used to write letters to my grandmother, and I got letters on a fairly regular basis. Um, what was the food like? The food was not very good at first, anyway, because uh, we got a lot of um, K rations, and it improved because one of the people in my tent was a sort of a petty thief, and he would filch food from the mess hall and we would cook it ourselves in a little kerosene stove that he got from somewhere. And uh, we really liked army beef stew. If somebody dumped, we loved, if somebody dumped olives and anchovies into it, um, <laughs> the reason was it made it very salty and we were very thirsty all the time. Oh, okay. Tip of the but the actual food in the uh, mess tent was not brilliant, okay. which was a disappointment. It had been pretty good in Germany. I, I kind of liked army food. It was very greasy. You got, you know, pancakes and bacon and stuff like that in the morning. I ate a very unhealthy diet in the army. But you said you did stay in shape, though. It looks like. Um, did you have enough supplies for what your job was? I had plenty of supplies. I mean, there was unlimited um, weapons and bullets and such like. Uh, my job just involved, you know cutting these orders to send these people home. And the problem wasn't supplies, the problem was that uh, record keeping, probably because Vietnam had been expanded so fast, was very poor. And tracking down all the people and making sure their names were correct, their service number was correct, if they had re-enlisted that they got the, you know, the assignment that they wanted, all those things. Um, that took time. We were in an administrative mess. I can't imagine. Um, did you feel pressure or stress? Yes, I felt pressure and stress. And how did you handle it? Well, it was a shared experience. I had a lot of good buddies. I'm still in touch with one of them. Um, I did not personally do drugs, though there were people who did. We drank a lot of, we could get um, weak beer at the PX in more or less unlimited amounts and we drank a lot of beer. Occasionally somebody would go in Saigon and get, you know, 
scotch or a whiskey or something from the big Navy PX and show it on and uh, bring it back. Um, there was a, quite a bit of drunkenness in the American Army then. Was there anything special you did for good luck? Did you have like a good luck charm or anything? No, I'm not, I'm not superstitious that way. Okay. Um, how did people entertain themselves? Drinking. Um, I missed Bob Hope. He had been there just before I got there, and I was sad about that because apparently his act was fantastic. The men were still talking about it when I got there. Um, he told wonderful jokes. And I really admired the man. He wasn't young, and you know, it was a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. We could have been mortared any night. Lots of places were. We saw the, the fuel tanks in Tansanut, the big airport in Saigon, burning. We could see them burning after a, a group of uh, Viet Cong infiltrators set them on fire and destroyed a lot of planes. That was just at the time when the captain told us everything was perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. But you, uh, were there any entertainers over there? No, oh, I miss Bob shows? Hope. Okay. No, no, there was no, there was no, when I was there, there was no EM, EM club, Anne Margaret didn't turn up, there was no, there was no fun. We got three day passes occasionally, I got I think two while I was there. And then there was R&R, &R, which I got once. And then where did you go and what did you do when you got leave air pass? My R&R, &R, I went to um, Thailand. Um, my r and was a little disappointing. I wish in hindsight I'd gone to Hong Kong, which I've been to since then and found absolutely fantastic. Um, I was so tired by the time I got to the place in, uh, on my r and I spent most of the first day in the swimming pool. I just wanted to get clean. And uh, also I wanted to eat. I ate a lot of Thai food. I went to see Thai boxing. Um, I did not sample any forbidden pleasures because there were plenty of those in Vietnam if you wanted them. That's another that had told me. Um, do you remember any particularly humorous or unusual events, like pranks or? Well, in many ways, my experience with the Army was one long humorous event. It has a catch-22 quality. Strange, goofy things are happening all the time. People will profess earnest patriotism and then behave and very peculiar and self-destructive or destructive ways. Um, things in Vietnam. Um, not really. I mean, I enjoyed a lot flying around in military aircraft. I, it sounds hard to even say this now because it was obviously a very dangerous thing to do. I could see all these crashed helicopters in the ground and even crash large planes. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're in your early 20s, you're a single man, you like excitement, um, it's kind of exciting. Okay. What did you think of the officers and your fellow servicemen? This is going to be somewhat controversial. I felt the quality of the officers, generally, that I met in the Army wasn't very good. Um, our colonel, for example, in Germany was a shouting, ill-tempered, and I thought ill-qualified uh, West Pointer. Despite his West Point background, he used to do things like calling his own call sign in the radio and then getting in a temper tantrum when nobody answered. I also saw him with a map out on the uh, hood of his Jeep, and his Jeep driver, who was a black private E3, was a friend of mine, showing him where we were on the map, which seemed to me kind of the wrong way around. Um, um, I didn't have that much contact with officers. To my way of thinking, the sergeants ran the army, and one of the problems that we had, which I became aware of in Vietnam, was as the old so-called brown boot army sergeants retired, who had been veterans of, in many cases, World War II and certainly Korea, their replacements were not as good. Um, they simply weren't up, up to the same standard. and. I mean, I think of our captain in Vietnam, he would give us these ridiculous little pep talks, which were immediately contradicted by reality, like saying, you know, everything is safe here, and then we'd see that the Viet Cong infiltrators had set all the fuel tanks in Saigon Airport on fire. Um, or he'd say, you know, this is a controlled area, and then every night we'd hear shooting, and occasionally artillery fire, and sometimes mortars, etc. 
not in our camp, but uh, even so, it made us aware that what he was saying was just silly. Uh, but to tell the truth, we didn't pay much attention to him anymore. Yeah. He, he, had, he had very little direct influence on me. Another thing I saw, which I've also put in that book, one day I was told to take some papers over to an officer to sign, and I went over to the officer's tent, and I found him absolutely zonked on some drug, lying on his cot with his arms like this. And on the side of his tent, inside of his tent, he had an enormous banner which said, fuck communism. Well, I thought, that's all well and good, but you are completely out of it on some drug. Here, I'm just going to drop these papers on the floor, and you can figure out what to do with them later. Uh, that's not a way to go through a place like that. Well, I just thought it was extremely stupid of him. Um, where were you when your service ended? I was discharged in Oakland. Okay. And do you remember that day and being discharged? Yeah, very vividly. Um, we were discharged in full dress uniform. I was given a great deal of money because I had all sorts of accumulated leave and bonds that I cashed and such like. Um, I got a big wadge of papers. I had my duffel bag. Obviously, I had no civilian clothing, so I just um, got on a bus and we went over to San Francisco Airport. And I was with two other sergeants from the 1st Infantry Division. They were infantry sergeants. And we went into the airport bar. We wanted a beer. And the waitress refused to serve these two guys, even though they had all kinds of combat medals, et cetera, because they were under 21. She was willing to serve me, but I thought her attitude was so, so bad. I left with them. It was a, a foretaste of the stuff that you would encounter in the U.S. if you said you'd been in the military. Mm -hmm. So you're, that was pretty much, what about your homecoming when you went back home? Well, I, my parents were glad to see me, but um, we weren't a very close-knit family. I just went back to Cleveland, got my clothes. I'd arranged to go back to Yale and just picked up my clothes, said hello. And then what did you do in the days and weeks afterwards, back to Yale? I went right back to you. Okay. Um, was your education supported by the GI Bill? Latterly, yes, but not at Yale, because um, Yale, in those days, was a very, very impersonal organization, and nobody told me about the GI Bill, and I was so stupid I didn't know anything about it. In fact, I was informed about it later by a history professor who became kind of a pal of mine. And uh, he suggested that I go and study at Oxford in England. And I said, how on earth will I afford this? And he said, well, you have the GI Bill. And I said, what's that? So this tenured professor at Yale told me something that the Yale admin should have told me, um, but didn't. Did you have any close friends in the service? I had buddies. I'm still in touch with one guy. Um, we exchange emails. I've tried to track down a couple of others. I would say my experience was that people were friendlies, friendly and we were buddies while we were there, but when it was over, it was over. I know a lot of other guys who've done you know, American Legion and stuff like that, but I was never interested in that. Okay. I do enjoy getting together with people and talking about Vietnam. The guy who runs the John Deere dealer over in Canaan, Steve, knows a lot about this stuff. I can't remember. He's a very, very nice man. And you're better in food? Yeah. So you tell stories you can. Um, what, what did you do, go on to do as a career after your service? I went on to, uh, I finished at Yale, graduated, went to Oxford, spent two years there, started working at an investment bank in London. Um, got married, decided I didn't know enough, went back to Stanford Business School and was recruited out of Stanford Business School by J.P. Morgan and spent years back in London working away in the uh, investment management business. Oh, okay. Um, how long were you in Europe and did you stay in London? Um, I spent my whole working career in London. Oh, okay. I was, by the time I graduated from Yale, I was very, very fed up with the U.S. attitude about the Vietnam War and other things that I'd seen. I, I, I saw 
what I considered cowardice. I saw the head of Yale, for example, came in Brewster um, advocating people, you know, deserting from the army and stuff like that. And I just felt this was an intolerable attitude. And I just, I wanted out. You know, they used to have these bumper stickers that said, America, love it or leave it. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't stop loving America, but I didn't want to hang around at that time. It was a nasty period, I thought. Great music, but a nasty period. Um, so you, did you join veteran, in, veteran organization? No. Do you attend any reunions? Army reunions? Yes. Vietnam reunions? No. Okay. I didn't even know there were such things. Um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? Hugely. <laughs> Hugely. I've, as I say, I've written a book about it. Look, I was a white suburban kid. I knew very little about the world outside my middle or even upper middle class upbringing. And certainly Yale is not a place to find out about the rest of the world. Um, the Army was an absolute revelation. I mean, on the one hand, I realized very quickly that um, most people are willing to accept that the average person is average. What they have a lot of trouble with is understanding what the average is and that if that is the average, there are a lot of people below average. And there are many, many, many of them. Um, and it's not that these are bad people, but they're not exactly good people often either. And they're very limited. And this explains a great deal about politics, for example. On the other hand, I also met some people who are absolute rough diamonds, one of whom I'm still in touch with, who in a totally just or open society would have done great things, I'm convinced of it, um, but that opportunity didn't come to them. Um, so it was, a very, it was very illuminating about the human race. It's also very illuminating about how to get things done. Um, you learn how to tackle projects, and it may not be very pretty, but you can get a lot of stuff done very quickly if you don't worry too much about exactly how it's done, which is very much the Army method. And I didn't learn that the best way to get things done was by shouting at people or brutalizing them. However, there are occasions where that works very well uh, at all levels of society. But generally, I found if you just showed people you were willing to work as hard as they were and could explain what was, what was required and as much as you understood it yourself, uh, you could get a lot done. I mean, I've seen must have been 30, 40 men pick up a truck that was sunk three feet deep in mud. And I'm not talking about a pickup truck. I'm talking about a big, big truck and lift it out of the mud. That's impressive. We built roads through the jungle in Vietnam that were just amazing. They're still using some of them. In fact, I saw American Army trucks in use there when I went back there in 1993. Wow. I've been back to Vietnam twice. When do you say that on the trip? What was that like? Was it the first time was a very strange kind of time work experience because we landed at Tan Sanu and they were just using everything that we had left there. Uh, they even had the, you know, the blast protection uh, base for the fighter jets, but they had MiGs in them instead of Phantoms. They still had the same lighting inside the airport, this overhead um, neon lighting that America used to have in 1959 or whatever. Uh, very unflattering to the human face. I, I had to get a visa to go to Vietnam, and it said, list all previous visits. And I thought, I'm not filling this in. That's not a good thing to fill in. Um, so I said, not applicable. It was completely, I was completely wrong. The Vietnamese didn't care. It's a very young country. I wouldn't say they exactly welcome veterans, but I talked to a number of people, and nobody, it was over as far as they were concerned. They won. And they were all about 25. It's a very young country. What about the second time you went back? The second time I went with an organized group. It was um, organized by the Stanford alumni. And um, Allison came with me that time. And that was just fascinating because uh, it was conducted by an emeritus professor from Stanford, an expert on Asia, and uh, named Lyman von Sleit. Um, and he was an amazing man and taught us so much about Vietnamese history, rice culture, the various kingdoms that had been there, uh, all the stuff that had occurred long before the French and the Americans went there to, to ruin the place. 
And we went all over North Vietnam as well. And there were other veterans on that trip, and that was kind of interesting. Did you reconnect with anyone that you had known before? No, not on that trip. Okay. But it was, it, was it interesting to talk to them about their experience? Yes, there was this one, it was absolutely fascinating. There was one guy on that trip who was a, I think, very bright, um, slightly eccentric lawyer from San Francisco, probably a gay man, who was still wearing a magnificent 1960s Jufro, the great <laughs> woolly mass of gray hair. And he'd been in the uh, 82nd Airborne, and uh, he professed a, you know, he was very modest about what he'd done, but you don't get into the 81st, 82nd Airborne um, without you know, going to jump school and so forth. So I suspected he had been a little more aggressive in the 1960s than he let on now. And he, we talked a lot about it. Uh, he was knowledgeable about the war, and by that time I knew quite a bit about it. Um, and we concluded the same thing that I, well, basically what I'd thought years before. Whether the Vietnam War was ever winnable, it certainly wasn't winnable the way we did it. And Johnson's crazy idea that you could turn war on and off according to your negotiating needs was just insane, just crazy. And why our generals went along with it is beyond me. Interesting. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's thank you. It's a joy meeting you and talking to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh,